Okay, um, welcome to week 10. Um, six lectures this week, we'll be getting off with farm, taking a look at atherosclerosis. So essentially today, we're just gonna be looking at how it forms, um, particularly the plaque, um, and kind of what mechanisms contribute to the plaque rupturing that causes uh, potential complications, which we'll also have a look at. And then we'll look into treatments for both acute and chronic um, management of um, atherosclerosis. So um, just a basic snapshot of what it is. So essentially it's a disease of the arteries um, characterized by a buildup of fatty material, which we call plaque on the inner walls of your arteries. And it's a disease that kind of manifests over many, many, many years. Um, there's often a positive color correlation with people who have a high concentration of low density lipoproteins um, and essentially um, the vascular inflammation uh, leads to development of the plaque um, and then ultimately a thrombus formation which is what causes um, the very uh, dangerous complications. So you can just see here in the diagram in the bottom left um, just a normal artery compared to that um, that has plaque in it, you can see that these arteries are much, much more narrow. Um, so yeah, we'll be taking uh, a bit of a look as to how it forms. So you, this diagram is just kind of to reiterate the fact that um, it's something that ha happens over many, many, many decades. So we've got growth mainly by lipid accumulation in kind of the first 10 to 30 years. And then in the, usually around the fourth decade is when you start to see um, these complications, um, thrombosis, hematoma, um, and the rupture there. So there's kind of six key steps that you guys can remember in the development of atherosclerosis. The first one is just looking at um, endothelium damage done by irritants. So these irritants, um, namely low density lipoproteins, uh, will infiltrate the inner layers of the artery and cause damage to the endothelium um, and possible irritants include lipids, like I mentioned, um, toxins from smoking and hypertension can also be another irritant. Um, the next step is the uptake of the LDL. So the low density lipoprotein is oxidized in your artery um, and essentially this induces adhesion molecule expression on the endothelium um, leading to macrophages, phagocytosing the LDLs, leading to the formation of foam cells. And it's this accumulation of the foam cell that forms a lipid core or your plaque in the first place. Um, and if you guys aren't sure what foam cells are, they're essentially a type of macrophage um, that localize to fatty deposits on the walls of your blood vessels. Um, and these macrophages will then ing uh, ingest the low density lipoproteins um, and essentially become loaded with lipids, um, giving that foamy appearance. Um, so next step is increased monocyte recruitment. So these adhesion molecules will increase the monocyte migration into the blood vessel. Um, so the key step to remember here is monocytes um, will then lead to the recruitment of macrophages, which will then subsequently release inflammatory markers and phagocytose oxidize LDLs. So the monocytes would differentiate into the macrophages here. Um, next, we have inflammatory surveillance. So this is just your typical immune response. Your T cells are going to infiltrate the inner layers leading to increased inflammation. So we've got a number of different immune cells here. We've got cytokines produced by your T cells. These are gonna to lead to an increased vascular inflammation. We've got more adhesion molecules, um, more monocytes coming to the area of fatty deposition. And then of course, increased foam cell and plaque formation because there are so many more macrophages coming to this site. Um, next we have fibrous cap. So the inflammatory response cause these endothelial cells to form a fibrous cap over the plaque. And this is essentially a protective mechanism to stop the formation of a thrombus. Um, and how this works is your smooth muscle will release um, calcium crystals uh, into the plaque, which leads to the hardening of your arteries. And then the last step in atherosclerosis is 
the rupture of the fibrous cap. So the plaque rupture would then cause the formation of a thrombus. This clot would then occlude the vessel. So the two key complications for you guys to know in first year is that if a thrombus occurs in a coronary artery, that's going to lead to an AMI. Whereas if it occurs in a cerebral artery, you're going to get a stroke. So in the brain. Um, okay, looking at treatment, um, we've got both acute and chronic. Your lecture mainly covers acute. So we'll also just to balance it out, have a look at chronic as well. So acute treatment, um, it is primarily going to consist of revascularization um, either by an angioplasty um, or a PCI, so percutaneous coronary intervention, um, or stents to kind of reopen the artery that has become narrowed. If you've had a stroke or an AMI, um, it's really important to administer TPA within 12 hours. Um, and essentially what this tissue plasminogen does is that it activates plasminogen to break down the clot itself. Um, looking at chronic treatment, obviously lifestyle modifications are gonna be really, really important. So thinking of the SNAP acronym here, um, addressing smoking related habits, um, if they're appropriate, um, diet's really important, um, removing any alcohol and also ensuring that um, your patients are maintaining um, an adequate amount of physical activity. Um, you can also have lipid-lowering drugs such as statins that help you um, monitor your cholesterol levels. And then lastly, things like antiplatelets and anticoagulants to kind of lower or um, reduce the risk of forming um, a clot. Um, so that is a snapshot of atherosclerosis. Any questions, please message me. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm going to be covering physiology lecture that you guys had this week. So it's electrical activity of the heart to, um, okay. So that started. So the lecture kind of breaks it down into three main like objectives that you guys needed to learn. So starting with um, looking at ECGs and how they relate to the electrical activity of the heart. I think the basic stuff that you need to know is that the P wave or the small bump at the very start um, is associated with the excitation of the atrium. Uh, the next big spike, which is the QRS complex, is associated with excitation of the ventricles and the T wave, which is um, the small bump at the end, or I guess not small, um, so it uh, represents the repolarization of the ventricles. Now, obviously there's a few cardiac mechanisms that are associated with each of these, but um, that will be covered in your week 12 lecture on like how the heart works. So that's fine. Uh, basically, what you need to know in terms of electrical excitation is that the ECG stands or like represents, I guess, the summation of the action potentials um, of both the nodal cells and the cardiomyocytes, which means that like the, the line that you see, like the red line in the first image that you see is basically um, a sum of all of the different um, atrial and ventricular potential. So you can see here, um, you've got a typical ventricular potential underneath the letter Q. Um, and that's why you get such a strong QRS complex because um, that plus the low value of the, um, the nodal cells means that you're gonna have a peak there, right? So it's not just like the excitation of one part, the ECG kind of represents um, all parts of the heart at once, okay? so. That's good for you to know, but basically what you need to know is P wave is excitation of the atrium and QRS is ventricles and T wave is repolarization, okay? Um, next is, this is probably the most important thing that's in this lecture is looking at cardiac arrhythmias and kind of what is sinus rhythm. So what you need to know is that the sinoatrial node is the primary pacemaker of the heart and why it's because that node is firing at the fastest rate consistently. So uh, the general conduction rate is 60 to 100, but usually they say around 70 beats per minute, okay? Um, the next fastest node would be the AV node, and then the slowest node is the Purkinje fibers, which is, goes around 40, right? Now, that's important because in the case of one of the nodes not working, then the next fastest node kind of takes over. So what you might get in the exam question, which is pretty common, is something like, 
Sino HU node stops firing, what's the new heart rate going to be? Um, or like, what's the new primary pacemaker rate going to be? And then you just have to know that it's the AV node and it's going to be 50. Okay, so it just goes in the order of what's the fastest. Um, so typically we've got the SA node firing at the highest rate. Okay, now if there is an AV node block, then that's a completely different thing because you've got the SA node working and you've got the Purkinje fibers working, but your AV node isn't working. So there's kind of like a delay in the middle. Now, what happens here is the atria, which as I said before, is going to be represented by the P wave, which is a small bump. Um, they'll continue firing at 70 beats per minute, or anywhere between 60 to 100. And the Purkinje fibers, which wrap around the ventricles and cause them to contract, will also continue to fire at 30 beats per minute. But because there's no AV node to synchronize this, they're going to continue firing independently of one another. And that's what's going to lead to the ECG that you see at the bottom. Um, that's this complete AV node block. So what's happening here is you'll see a lot of little bumps. Um, and what that means is that you've got P waves happening in a repeated fashion, but you don't have the QRS complex happening right after that. And that's because the Purkinje fibers are the ones that innovate the Q, like the ventricles. Oh, sorry, not innovate, provide the um, electrical excitation to the ventricles. And since they're firing at a rate that's much slower than the, the SA node fibers, you're going to get much less ventricular excitation. Okay. So the key sign for like looking at an ECG and seeing an AV node block is that you're going to have multiple P waves in between QRS complexes because the SA node is firing and so is the Purkinje fibers, but it's not synchronized anymore because there's an AV node block. Now, the one on top is ventricular fibrillation. Now, that's just basically, if you just see a bunch of squiggles on your ECG, then you've got a ventricular fibrillation, uh, which is really bad and needs urgent treatment. But again, that's gonna be covered in the Clint Skills lecture about ECGs. This is just kind of briefly talked about in the lecture. The, completely, um, the complete AV node block is much more important in terms of understanding the physiology um, of how, I guess, sinus rhythm works. Uh, lastly, we're looking at autonomic control of HR. So this is the, probably the last thing that was covered in the lecture that was important. Um, now there's two main innovations. There's you've got sympathetic and you've got parasympathetic. So sympathetic innovation is gonna increase your force of contraction, which will lead to improved cardiac output. Again, I think you're learning that a little bit later, but if you've learned it already, that's great. Um, and then better blood flow to your muscle tissue during exercise. So when you're exercising, you're gonna have increased rate of firing of synthetic axons and nerves, and that's going to lead to a greater output of blood, especially to your muscles, um, which will allow you to keep exercising or perform better, right? Especially when you're tired. Now, the other things that sympathetic innovation does is it innovates the sinoatrial node and also increases the rate of AV node conduction and you can increase your heart rate up to 230 beats per minute, which is really important to think about because our normal heart rate is like our resting heart rate, I should say, is somewhere around 60 to 100 beats per minute. So 230 means that there's a potential for like a much greater cardiac output if required. And that's important. And I'll come back to that in a second. But another thing to note is that on the ventricles, if you look at the image, they only have supply from sympathetic. They don't have parasympathetic muscarinic receptors. They only have beta, beta adrenergic receptors, okay? So that means that <laughs> the ventricles don't have parasympathetic tone. Um, and that's, I mean, yeah, that's just something to note because I've seen that in exam questions before as well. So yeah, yeah. Well, parasympathetic innovation is basically the opposite, but because it doesn't innovate the ventricles, it can't really change the force of contraction, whereas the sympathetic can cause greater contraction because it innovates the ventricles, right? Now, it can go as low as 20 beats per minute because parasympathetic is trying to slow you down. Now, typically for resting heart rate, you'll notice that 60 to 100 is much closer to the parasympathetic lower limit than the sympathetic upper limit. And that's because usually 
even though there's a balance, vagal tone kind of overrides the sympathetic tone. So basically that means that the vagus nerve um, has a greater control when we're at a resting state. And that's why our resting heart rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. But yeah, I think that's it. Yep. So this week <clears throat> I'll be presenting um, lectures on anatomy. Uh, so starting with the th uh, thoracic cage, moving on to heart, um, heart anatomy, adult anatomy, and then well, embryology first and adult anatomy. So the thoracic cage, um, the main functions of the thoracic cage is to protect the inner organs, um, to facilitate respir um, respiration uh, by providing space for the lungs, by decreasing friction for the movement of the lungs and coordinating the movement of the lungs using muscles. Um, the thoracic cage is composed of the ribs, um, the um, vertebrae, which you can't see in this picture because this is looking from posterior to anterior. Um, you can see the sternum in this image and also the muscles, intercostal muscles, as well as the diaphragm. Um, so some surface anatomy to kick us off. Uh, we've got clavicles, which um, you would have learned about in upper limb. Um, and in between, you'll feel the um, suprasternal notch is the first bony landmark as you come down into the chest. Um, uh, it's also called the jugular notch. Um, and that's where, that's the top of your sternum, um, which is the top of a bone called the manubrium. We'll see you later. Um, then where the manubrium, so this part, joins with the sternal body, um, that's the sternal angle and that connects to the second rib. Um, and there's also the xiphosternal junction, which is where the body of the sternum attaches to the xiphoid process, which is a small triangular sort of shaped bone at the tip of, at the inferior edge of the um, sternum. Um, and you've also got your costal margin, um, which is like the inferior border of the um, rib cage. So continuing on, um, there are some lines. Uh, some of these are pretty useful, others are not. So we've got the median line, we've got parasternal lines, which are adjacent to either side of your sternum. Para means either side of. Uh, you've got mid clavicular lines. So the orange ones, they're drawn from the midpoint of your cl clavicle, straight inferiorly. Um, you've got mammary lines, which are um, vertical and crosses your nipple, but that depends on, that's pretty much different on like everybody. So you don't need to worry about that too much. And again, with the nipple, it's very variable in its placement, but usually it's about the fourth intercostal space. Um, and moving laterally, you've got the auxiliary lines, which are... There are three, so anterior axillary line, um, mid axillary line along your armpit, and your posterior axillary line, which is um, at the back of your armpit. Okay, so bony structures. You've got ribs. Um, usually there's 12 ribs. Um, so the true ribs are ribs one to seven, which attach via the individual costal cartilage. Um, you've got false ribs, which is ribs 8 to 10, highlighted in orange. Um, they attach via um, interchondral joints along the costal margin. So if you imagine joints between cartilage, um, that's what they attach to um, here. And you've got floating ribs, ribs 11 and rib 12, um, which don't attach to the sternum at all. So they're like floating midair. Um, there's also um, cervical or lumbar ribs, which might occur in some patients. So you might get an extra rib or pair of ribs, um, like a 13th rib lower than the 12th rib or higher than the first rib. Um, but that's relatively low incidence. Um, bony structures continued. Uh, there's a the sternum, which is illustrated here. You've got your manubrium, which is this large part at the top. 
there's the sternal body um, where they join, where the manubrium and the sternal body join is the sternal angle, or it's also called the angle of Louis sometimes. Um, there's facets for um, joints with the ribs, and there's also the xiphoid process, which is a little bony part that attaches to the body. Um, to make up the rib cage, you've also got, the, to make up the thoracic cage, you also have um, the T1 to T12 thoracic vertebrae, uh, which is the posterior border of the, um, uh, of the thoracic cage. Okay, muscles. Um, the, there are intercostal muscles which run in between ribs. So there are three layers of intercostal muscles. You've got the external intercostal muscles, um, which sort of run in a hands in pockets direction. So diagonally towards the middle downwards. Um, and they elevate the ribs during inspiration. So when you're breathing in, um, these help elevate the, rib, the ribs. Uh, your internal intercostal muscles, as you can see here, sort of like a hand on chin. So pointing this way, the muscle fibers, they depress your ribs during forced expiration. So breathing out, the ribs get lower. Um, and you've also got your innermost intercostal muscles, which run vertically. Uh, they also help in depression of the ribs during forced expiration. Okay, so the diaphragm is it makes up the inferior border of the thorax. Uh, it's the primary muscle of respiration. And um, as Prof um, Lazarus would have you know, uh, C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Um, so it's innervated by the phrenic nerve and it has three main hiatuses. So the aortic hiatus, which is at the T12 level, this one, you've also got a esophageal hiatus at T8, and you've got, oh, sorry, T10. You've got a caval hiatus, which is for the um, inferior vena cava at the level T8. Um, and when this muscle contracts, uh, it shortens, so it expands the space in the thoracic cage, which draws the lungs out. Um, you'll learn about this next year, but it, it's negative pressure that expands the lungs and draws the air in. And when this muscle relaxes, it um, squeezes the air out of the lungs, basically. Um, these are some low yield muscles to learn, but um, I'll just uh, talk about each one of them. So transversus thoracis uh, attaches from the rib to the um, sternum. Uh, the subcostal muscles, uh, they, they traverse several ribs at a time. Um, and they run on the, they, they're posterior or deep to the innermost um, in, intercostal muscles. Uh, you've also got posteriorly the serratus serrat um, posterior muscles, uh, superiorly and inferiorly. Uh, the superior ones elevate the ribs and the inferior fibers depress the ribs. Uh, and there's also levatores uh, costarum, brevis and longus. I don't think they ever came up. Um, but yeah, so the thoracic cavity is a space inside the thoracic cage that's created by these uh, bony structures. There's two apertures, one superior and one inferior. Uh, the superior aperture is also known as the um, thoracic inlet. Uh, and through this aperture passes the trachea, the esophagus, uh, blood vessels to the head and upper limbs, as well as the apex of the lungs. They, so they slot in there. Um, the inferior aperture is limited by the diaphragm, which you saw in previous slides. It sort of goes across here. Um, there's hiatuses for the aorta, the IVC, and the esophagus. So uh, some spaces in the thoracic cage, there's the pleural cavity, it's a potential space, which means usually there's no space there, but if a, say a fluid or air fills that space, it can expand um, like we see here. So right around the lungs, inseparable from 
the organ itself is a layer of um, connective tissue called the visceral pleura. And um, then it's reflected at um, the root of the lung into what's called the parietal pleura. So you get two layers of connective tissue that are usually sticking together with a bit of fluid between them. But if fluid or air build up between these, um, but in, inside between the layers, um, it expands this potential space into like an actual space. So the pleural cavity is the potential space between the two layers of pleura. Um, and the pericardial cavity is uh, similar. So you've got a layer of um, visceral pericardium, which is just connective tissue. Uh, and outside of that, um, you've got a layer of parietal pericardium um, in between which there's some fluid, but not much. So um, with say a bleed, that, that space will expand into an actual space, but normally it's a potential space. Um, another space, a natural space in the thoracic cage is the mediastinum. So that's the space between the two lungs. Um, and it can be separated into four major regions. So the superior mediastinum, highlighted in green here, that contains the thymus, um, the, the veins, so the brachiocephalic veins, as well as the superior vein cava, uh, arteries for the arms and the head, um, also the trachea and esophagus, as well as the thoracic duct, which is a um, lymphatic drainage pathway as well as nerves passing through the um, thorax. Uh, so the inferior mediastinum, as we see here, is divided into three parts. The anterior highlighted in purple, the middle mediastinum highlighted in yellow, and the blue, which is the posterior mediastinum. Um, and there's a line called the transthoracic, transthoracic plane that divides the um, superior and inferior mediastinum, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, in the inferior mediastinum, um, there's not much going on in the anterior mediastinum. In children, it may contain the thymus. Um, in the middle mediastinum, so that's mainly the heart and the pericardium, as well as the ascending aorta, so this region. Um, the superior vein cover, which runs down um, from the top. Uh, the pulmonary trunk, which is where the blood gets pumped out into the lungs, um, as well as the phrenic nerve, so this nerve here, and the um, cardiac plexus, so nerves that innervate the heart, um, as well as lymph nodes that um, drain the trachea and the bronchi. Uh, the posterior mediastinum has the descending aorta, um, also the thoracic duct, which drains the, pretty much everything drains into the thoracic duct, right? I think. Um, and the zygous vein network, which is the uh, veins that drain the chest. Um, you've also got the esophagus passing down posterior to the heart, um, as well as the sympathetic trunk. So sympathetic innervation of the thorax. Um, now the sternal angle, so remember what I said about the manubrium uh, joining with the body of the sternum, that is the sternal angle. And if you draw a line through that sternal angle posteriorly to um, the level of T4, T5 vertebra, um, that's, where you, that's where you get the transthoracic plane. Um, and there are several landmarks um, that pass through the transthoracic plane. So you've got the main, the main two are the arch of the aorta. So from here, it's the ascending aorta, aorta ascending. It turns at this point um, when it goes through this plane. Uh, that's the arch of the aorta, so the very top. Um, and you've also got where the trachea bifurcates into two. Um, so one turns into one bronchi, uh, bronchi, bronchus, sorry, into each lung. Um, and this, where they split is called the carina. So 
that all happens at the transthoracic plane. Uh, now, neurovasculature, um, the intercostal nerves originate from the um, anterior rami of the um, thoracic uh, spinal cord. You can see here. Um, it innervates the thoracic wall muscle um, first, then it becomes uh, the cutaneous nerves. Uh, the vagus and phrenic nerves also pass through the thorax, um, as we can see here. So this is the phrenic nerve. Um, it innervates the um, diaphragm, as well as the vagus nerve, um, which um, is a cranial nerve, and it comes down innervates the heart and also goes on to innervate the digestive system. Um, the internal thoracic arteries, they, uh, the internal thoracic arteries originate from subclavian arteries and um, they derive the anterior intercostal arteries, um, whereas the posterior intercostal arteries come from the, the aorta, the descending aorta directly and they anastomose um, with each other. Uh, the intercostal veins, um, they have various sites of drainage. The right intercostal veins um, drain into the azygous vein, um, and the left veins, they, the left intercostal veins, they drain into um, the left subclavian the hemiozygous accessory hemiozygous and superior intercostal veins. So there's various drainages for the left intercostal veins, um, but they all eventually drain into um, the superior vena cava. Um, and there's also costal grooves, which are like grooves on the um, inferior surface of the ribs, and they sort of provide space for passing neurovasculature um, in between the layers of internal intercostals and the innermost intercostal muscles. Um, so these, these bundles of neurovasculature are called neuro, um, intercostal bundles. And from superior to inferior, the main branches run vein, artery, then nerve, so van, V-A-N, um, and directly superior to the lower rib is the collateral branch, are the collateral branches, um, which go um, nerve, artery, then vein, so NAV. And if you ever do intercostal injections, it's better to go a bit further inferiorly than superiorly, because it's um, if you accidentally hit something, you'd rather hit the collateral branches, which aren't as important as the main branches up here. Okay, moving on to the heart. Um, we're starting with embryology. Uh, so the formation of the heart, um, a single tube forms from two um, mesenchymal tubes um, previously. So it forms a tube like this. Um, the top and the bottom are anchored um, to the body, to, to, to other body parts. Um, so the top is the truncus arteriosus that would eventually become uh, the arteries that go out of the heart um, into the lungs and the body respectively. Um, and it's anchored inferiorly by the sinus venosus, um, which become the atria. So the heart begins to beat at around five to five to six weeks into the pregnancy. Um, so it beats while it's still in the tube shape. And after that, it starts looping. So the cardiac tube will grow in length, but it's still attached at the same site. So um, there will be this sort of looping action you can see here, where the atria, which starts off inferiorly, is folded to be posterior and in, um, uh, superior to the ventricles. Um, you'll also get septum development, which is what separates the atria into the left and right atria and the ventricles into the left and right ventricles, um, as well as valve development. And 
The last step would be the formation and partition of the outflow tract, which separates the um, separates the truncus arteriosus into aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So after we've done the folding, um, the septum will fold. Uh, so there's two septums, the atrial septum, um, which forms between the atria uh, and the ventricular septum, which forms between the ventricles. The steps for growth of the atrial septum is that there will be a septum primum that grows from the, the heart wall towards the endocardial cushion in the like the center of the heart, um, which it will grow slowly. This first hole, um, I can, I'll draw it out actually. So it will grow sort of like this, where this is the endocardial cushion, its destination. This is, this is called, this bit is called the ostium primum. Eventually when the, so the first, that's the first um, ostium, I guess. When it eventually reaches the endocardial cushion, it's going to keep growing, but a part of it's going to be open. Um, one sec. So um, a part of it will be left open, and that's called the ostium secundum. Um, and after that, a second septum will grow. Um, which is called the septum secundum. So it's a bit confusing, but um, just bear with me for a second. It will leave a, another hole, um, which is what you see here. It's called the um, foramen ovale. Um, and the septum secundum is also a bit thicker than septum primum, which um, as you'll see later helps with fetal development and the eventual formation of um, adult heart with blood flow. Um, and blood flow in the baby will flow across the pressure gradient, um, which at this point is higher, the pressure is higher in the right atrium than the left atrium, which means blood will flow towards the um, left atrium. So it sort of hits that flap goes into the um, ostium secundum um, and then into the left atrium. So um, after the baby is born, this, um, these two will eventually fuse and that would prevent blood flow from the atria, um, from one atria to the other. Um, the ventricular septum grows as, um, one grows, one part of it grows from the endo, uh, endocardial cushion. That's the membranous part, it grows inferiorly and the muscular part grows from the cardiac wall superiorly, um, which will, they will join at the middle to form the um, ventricular septum. And here's how the valve is formed um, on the picture on the left. So the atrioventricular valves, the valves between the atria and the ventricles, they'll form sort of like this. Um, so they'll form, and once they mature, they'll still have attachments to the um, to a muscle and the what we call chordae tendinae, um, which help. Uh, stabilize the valve so it doesn't um, flap back into the atria. Um, and for the semilunar valves, which are the aortic and pulmonary valves, um, on the arteries, they form like this. So they, they sort of um, excavate a hole or a ditch in the, um, in the, cusps, um, which you'll see in later slides. Um, and this is how the pericardium is formed. So you've got mesoderm, so again, connective tissue that 
sort of invaginates and wraps around the heart um, and separates it from the lungs. So this will um, form what's the, uh, the parietal pericardium. And then another layer will wrap around this layer of pericardium. So you'll gain another layer of connective tissue, which is the fibrous um, pericardium. Um, so just to introduce the whole, I've, I'm going to talk about how the blood flows in the heart, just so we can then talk about fetal circulation. So um, the blood, the oxygenated blood collected from the body in the adult is um, going to flow into the right atrium by the superior and inferior vena cava. Um, from the right atrium, it goes into the right ventricle, which then pumps it into the pulmonary trunk, into the lungs, where the blood will get um, oxygen from the lungs. After that, it will flow back to the heart by the pulmonary veins um, into the left atrium. So oxygenated blood at this point from the left atrium into the left ventricle, then finally out of the aorta into systemic circulation. And um, note here, uh, the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins, um, they are sort of the opposite of what happens in the body. The artery contains deoxygenated blood um, and the veins contain oxygenated blood. It's called an artery in the vein um, because artery just means going away from the heart and vein means flowing back to the heart. Um, so in fetal circulation, um, the, the fetus's um, liver and lungs are not functioning. So you get, you get um, nutrients and um, oxygen, oxygenated blood from the mother, from the uh, placenta, uh, it will flow across the umbilical cord into um, the liver. Um, but since the liver isn't functioning, it's not, it's not going to have blood passing through it. There's something called a ductus venosus, which shunts blood directly into the inferior vena cava. Um, so that sort of bypasses the liver and um, pumps it straight into the heart. Um, and since the lungs are also not working, um, you can't pump um, out of the um, pulmonary trunk. It won't go into it won't go into the lungs because the lungs are closed at this point. Um, so there's two points um, at which the blood will be shunted towards the left atrium to be pumped into systemic circulation. One is uh, the through the um, atrial septum foramen, foramina um, through, so through the foramen ovale and then the sept, um, through the osseum secundum um, in which it will then be pumped out into the aorta. And another, um, another path for oxygenated blood to travel directly from the right ventricle into systemic circulation is the ductus arteriosus. So that's a little portal between, so that's a bridge between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. So the blood will be pumped straight from the pulmonary trunk, uh, from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk, then into the aorta. Um, so that's how blood from the mother would get to systemic circulation in the fetus. Um, since the lungs and the liver aren't working. Um, so there are several shunts. Um, so three that we talked about. Uh, one's, one's bypassing the liver, that's the ductus venosus. Um, and that becomes ligamentum venosum in the adult, which is just a ligament in the liver. Um, you might see in your dissection next year. Um, but it doesn't do anything in the adult body. Same with uh, the foramen ovale. Um, it's between the right and left atria um, and allows oxygenated blood to flow from the right to the left atrium. Um, but once 
or postnatally, um, it will slowly grow into one singular septum um, with the holes closed. Uh, and there's still going to be, but there's still going to be a little sort of ditch on the septum. That's the um, fossa ovalis. So that's the remnant of the foramen ovale. Um, and also there's the ductus arteriosus, which um, goes from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta. Uh, in the adult, that becomes a ligament called ligamentum arteriosum, and it has no function. So it's just a ligament. Um, there are some embryological defects which can form during um, heart development. So an atrial septal defect is where there's a patency in the atrial septum. Um, the blood now, since uh, systemic circulation pressure is higher than that of pulmonary circulation, blood will shunt from the left atrium to the right atrium this time. Um, and another defect is, the, uh, is a ventricular septal defect. So instead of the atria, it, it occurs in the um, ventricle. Um, this would also cause right to, uh, left to right shunting due to the pressure gradient. Um, and this most often happens in the thinner membranous part. So the part that grows from the, um, the um, bicardial cushion uh, inferiorly towards the um, cardiac wall. Um, and the, there's also a possibility of a patent ductus arteriosus. So um, the uh, shunt uh, from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta being um, remaining open would lead to aortic blood being pumped into the pulmonary trunk. Um, there's also something called the tetralogy, um, Tetralogy of Fallot, um, which is a combination of four, um, four defects that combine to have um, an effect of uh, reducing the cardiac output and also the oxygen content of the blood pumped out. Um, so that, that's um, composed of a ventricular septal defect. So there's a hole in the ventricular um, septum. There's an overriding aorta, which uh, means the aorta uh, is um, connected to the right atrium, uh, sorry, right ventricle as well as the left ventricle, um, which will lead to, oh, not will lead to, but um, you will also get in the tetralogy of fallow, um, pulmonary stenosis, so narrowing of the pulmonary valve. Um, this will lead to uh, right ventricular hypertrophy because you've got to pump harder through that valve to get enough blood through. Um, and this mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood will, um, will reduce the oxygen content in the body as well as these defects. These defects also reduce oxygen content in systemic circulation, uh, which leads to things like cyanosis or... Um, hypoxia in general um yeah that's it for embryology now the adult heart anatomy um let's talk about the general orientation of the heart first so as you can see in this chest x-ray the heart's positioned approximately midline with the apex of the heart in the um, left side of the body um you've got the, um, yeah, okay. So you can see the aortic arch going superiorly there. You've got the um, superior being the cava. Um, posterior to the heart, you can also sort of see the um, esophagus heading down into um, below the diaphragm to the um, stomach, which is not the topic we're talking about today, but um, it does go there. You'll see a bubble there. That's um, that's gas um, in the stomach. On an X-ray, it'll show us that. Um, you've got some. Oh, 
you've got some angles, which are the costal phrenic angles. So phrenic is diaphragm, costal means the um, ribs. So the costal phrenic angle is this angle here, um, as well as this angle here. You've got the um, cardiophrenic, which is uh, cardio heart and phrenic is the diaphragm. So this angle here. And any abnormalities in these angles can or can show a pathology, um, which you'll probably see in imaging or other workshops. Um, you've got the valves. Um, these are sort of the rough positions of the valves. Um, so there's the um, pulmonary valve. So the right ventricle will pump into this pulmonary trunk here. Um, you've got the, uh, the other semilunar valve, the aortic valve, which uh, from which the left ventricle will pump through into the aorta. Um, there's the mitral valve, otherwise known as the bicuspid valve because it's got two cusps. Um, that goes, that's in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Um, and you've also got the tricuspid valve, which goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Um, these red circles are the areas where you would auscultate for um, these valves. Um, so you're not actually auscultating on the valve, you're auscultating um, a bit further down the track from where the blood would flow after, the valve, after it passes the valve. So um, we'll talk about this later in examination um, for clinical skills. Uh, further orientation, the right ventricle is the most anterior part of the heart. Um, and the left ventricle is the most inferior um, part of the heart. The left atrium is the most posterior part of the heart. And the right atrium just sort of sits sits there you can see on this x-ray there's some outlines for each part of the each chamber of the heart okay so the general structure um you've got two atria and two ventricles with um the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava um, carrying deoxygenated blood into the right atrium uh passing the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which then gets pumped, the blood gets pumped into the lungs via the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary arteries, um, where it becomes oxygenated. It comes back in via the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, uh, where, it float, where it gets pumped into the left ventricle, then out of the aorta into systemic circulation. Um, so the valves here, the tricuspid valve is between the right atrium and right ventricle and the mitral valve um, are between the left atrium and left ventricle. So these two are called um, atrioventricular valves, which as the name implies um, is between the atrium and the ventricle. And you've got the semilunar, so half moon shaped valves um, the pulmonary valve and the aortic valves. Um, they each have three cusps, which you can't see here, but um, they, they are the valves on the arteries going out of the heart. So um, attached to the AV valves, atrium and atrioventricular valves, are chordae tendinae, which then connects them to papillary muscles on the um, on the heart wall. Uh, these structures just help keep the AV valves in place so that they don't collapse into the atria. Um, and therefore they only allow single direction movement. Same with semilunar valves. Um, the valves are designed, um, well not designed, but like they're formed in such a shape that it prevents backflow. Um, so semilunar valves are in the arteries. So again, arteries, they don't denote um, whether the blood is oxygenated or not. They just mean that it's blood outgoing from the heart. Um, 
and you've got the pulmonary valve pulmonary valve here with its three cusps. Um, and you've got the aortic valve here. The difference being there are two openings for the coronary arteries, um, one left and one right, which supply the heart muscle um, itself. Um, so as the blood gets pumped out, these cusps will open. So that shuts the openings for the arteries. But once, once the... Um, once the ventricles expand, blood flows back, the cusps are closed. So you'll get space in between the cusp and the um, aortic wall, which allows for blood to flow into the coronary arteries. Um, and for the atrioventricular valves, you can see here the bicuspid or mitral valve that's between the um, left atrium and left ventricle as well as the tricuspid valve um, between the right atrium and ventricle. Um, so valve issues are mainly classified into stenosis, which is narrowing. Um, so it doesn't open properly. Or um, there's also valvular regurgitation, which means it doesn't close properly and um, there will be backflow through the valve. Um, blood supply of the heart, there are two main arteries. So as we've seen with the, um, the openings at the um, valve level, there's a left coronary artery, which is highlighted here. It heads towards the left. That's the left coronary artery until it divides into the um, left anterior descending artery. Uh, which supplies the anterior part of the left ventricle, as well as uh, the anterior two thirds of the ventricular septum. Um, continuing further um, laterally, you've got the circumflex artery and the marginal, um, the left circumflex and left marginal arteries. Um, they supply the left atrium. So this, so this part as well as the free wall of the left ventricle, so the lateral side. Um, now, with the right coronary artery, it's this artery here. Um, there's the um, circumflex and marginal branches, which supply the right atrium and the right ventricle. Um, and in most people, um, you'll get uh, along the right coronary artery, you've got the posterior descending artery, um, which supplies the infraposterior um, left ventricle. Um, so it supplies sort of this region posteriorly. And also the posterior two thirds of the um, ventricular septum. So I said most people because um, there's variation in coronary artery um, placement for different people. Uh, in most people, the posterior descending artery is, uh, uh, is derived from the right coronary artery. But in a, about a fifth of the population, um, or maybe a tenth, a tenth or a fifth, if I remember correctly, um, the posterior descending artery originates from the left, um, left coronary artery. Um, so instead of the posterior descending coming from the right, you get it from the left. And uh, this can be dangerous because um, essentially the heart's a bit too reliant on the left coronary artery. If that fails, you get failure of an entire left ventricle, the entire left ventricle becomes um, ischemic. Um, or they, they don't get enough oxygen supply, essentially. Um, so continuing on, we've got the venous drainage of the uh, heart muscle. Um, so there's a main vein which is called the coronary sinus. It drains directly into the right atrium. Um, 
and the main tributaries to the um, coronary sinus are the um, great cardiac vein, which runs with the left anterior descending artery um, along the anterior surface of the um, heart. Um, and you've got, you've also got the middle cardiac vein, which runs with the posterior descending artery. And um, you've also got a small cardiac vein, which drains the um, right ventricle from the, from its um, infralateral wall. Um, so pericardium, as we saw in the earlier slide um, with the um, mesen, um, mesentery sort of um, forming circles around the heart, um, you can see the different layers that it, it eventually forms here. Um, so you've got the, uh, there's the fibrous uh, pericardium, which is the outermost layer. Um, that is attached to the parietal pericardium. So you can't separate the fibrous and the um, parietal pericardium. Uh, but there's, there's a potential space, the pericardial space in between the layers of parietal pericardium and the um, visceral pericardium, which is, um, which is directly attached to the heart itself. Um, so there will be some pericardial fluid in there, but there's not a whole lot. Um, and that's a potential space. So you could build up fluid in there and that would cause um, pathology. Um, but basically there's three layers of um, pericardium and the parietal pericardium and visual pericardium together is called the serous pericardium because they have serum or fluid in between them. So they're called the serous, serous pericardium together. Um, innervation of the heart. Uh, you've got sympathetic supply from the spinal cord um, levels of T1 to T5. Uh, these increase heart rate and force of contraction, as Pune talked about earlier. Um, the parasympathetic supply of the heart is derived from the vagus nerve, so cranial nerve number 10. Uh, the preganglionic uh, pre axons um, synapse in the uh, cardiac ganglion. Um, and postganglionic fibers will be implanted in the um, sinoatrial and um, atrioventricular nodes. And the parasympathetic supply would slow the heart rate and also reduce the force of um, cardiac contraction. Uh, the sensory fibers of the um, heart would run with the sympathetic trunk and enter the spinal cord at levels um, T1 to T5. Um, You'll get referred pain in the chest, um, shoulder and arm if, um, if your heart is say, um, say injured or if there is pain passing through, um, you'll get referred pain, which um, I don't know if you've learned the mechanism of referred pain or not, but it, it's basically because the body doesn't um, sense uh, internal organ pain as well as it does with um, so a muscular or um, or more superficial structures. So when your brain gets pain signals from your internal organs, it will mistake that for um, pain signals coming from the um, musculature or the um, skin or the or the more superficial structures um, that are innervated by the same uh, nerve roots. So uh, the parietal pericardium, however, is innervated by the phrenic nerve. So I'll take you guys through cardiac biomarkers, which is a <clears throat> which is a part of pharmacology this week. So um, to start, these are the learning objectives. It's always good to keep these in mind when you're considering a lecture. Essentially, this lecture is all about um, acute coronary syndrome and heart failure, and then the biomarkers that are used to diagnose these and also predict these. So to start off, we'll start by discussing what coronary heart disease actually is. So we start off the lecture by learning about acute coronary syndrome, and acute coronary syndrome is essentially just a group of diseases that involve reduced blood flow to the heart. And the presentation of these diseases always tends to lead with chest pain. 
And so what you see on the right is a diagram that depicts this acute coronary syndrome like continuum, which essentially just means like the, um, the most common things you see uh, in terms of acute coronary syndrome, and it gets worse as you go further down. So what you see is that as a result, one category of this group of acute coronary syndromes is a myocardial infarction, which is where you have lo complete loss of blood flow to a certain part of the of the heart, which results in infarction of the myocardiocytes, which means a necrosis of the my uh, cardiomyocytes. So this can either be a STEMI or a non-STEMI, which means ST elevated myocardial infarction or non um, ST elevated myocardial infarction. So if there is no necrosis, um, we would call this unstable angina, uh, which just means chest pain that comes up without any reason, um, which is usually due to reduced blood flow in the heart. So the important part of this is just that the, the way we know that necrosis is occurring in the heart is through cardiac biomarkers, and that's the reason that they're important. So to first start by discussing the difference between a STEMI and an NSTEMI, the main way that you see this difference is through an ECG. And we've already talked about ECGs today, so we'll hopefully be familiar with the idea that the ST segment is the, the sort of area after the QRS complex and before the T wave. So what you see in a um, STEMI is that the ST is elevated um, and there's a myocardial infarction. So what that what you see there is the diagram on the right, which shows transmural ischemia. Um, and the difference between a STEMI and an NSTEMI is just that in a non-STEMI, either the ST segment will either be depressed or it'll just be normal. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't a myocardial infarction going on. It just means that the infarction is only subendocardial and not transmural, which means that it goes all the way across the wall of the ventricle. So the way that ca uh, cardiac biomarkers are used to diagnose a myocardial infarction is that there are two main biomarkers, but the one that is used most commonly is called cardiac troponin, and that's the one on the bottom. To start with, though, we'll talk about creatinine kinase. This is found in heart and skeletal muscle, and it exists in three main isoforms, BB, MM, and MB. Um, and what we know is that uh, creatinine kinase MB is relatively heart specific. And to explain why this is actually important, it's that biomarkers are things that are released by cells when they undergo necrosis. So as a result, you know that necrosis in, is occurring when you see levels of these cardiac biomarkers go up, because that tells you that there's necrosis occurring in the heart. And so Unfortunately, since creatinine kinase is found in other parts of the body, it's not necessarily as accurate as cardiac troponin, which is the gold standard. So what happens with cardiac troponin is that if there is an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack, you'll be able to detect that four to 10 hours because cardiac troponin levels will rise. It will peak at around 12 to 48 hours after a um, AMI, and then it will continue to be abnormal four to 10 days after the event which is quite useful, especially if there is a AMI that the person might not necessarily realize. It might be a small AMI or there might be just a small attack that the person might not realize, but their cardiac troponin will be high, which reveals that they did have an attack or an ischemic attack on the heart. So again, this is another slide to sort of depict um, the time course of these biomarkers. Um, but even though cardiac troponin is the gold standard, it's still not perfect because certain things can still cause levels to increase. So what we know is that things like demand ischemia, so things such as like pulmonary complications, such as um, infections to the heart can also increase cardiac troponin. Uh, things like direct damage through chemotherapy and renal impairment can all increase cardiac troponin levels in the bloodstream. What you also see on the right here is that regardless of whether um, there's a large myocardial infarction or a small myocardial infarction, you can see that the levels of troponin remain elevated for the same amount of time. It also shows you that um, around one to two days is when the troponin levels will be highest with a large myocardial infarction. So now we'll go on to talk about heart failure, which is what usually happens to hearts after they have gone through a infarction event or an ischemic attack. So what happens following ischemia is that cardiomyocytes cannot regenerate and as a result, they're replaced by fibrous or scar tissue. And what this means is that 
uh, scar tissue does no, no longer has the function of the, the cardiomyocytes. And as a result, you have decreased contractility and decreased output of the heart, which is what heart failure is. This diagram on the right shows you the main two areas that I'll draw your attention to are the bottom two, um, the bottom two images, which show the hypertrophied start and the heart and the dilated heart, which are respectively diastolic and systolic heart failure. So I'll talk a little bit more about what those two are. So systolic heart failure is when you have heart expansion or hypertrophy, sorry, not hypertrophy, you have heart expansion, which means that um, there aren't as many cardiomyocytes on the wall of the heart, which means that there's decreased contact contractility. With diastolic heart failure, what you have is a hypertrophied heart. And as a result, there's not as much space in the ventricles, which means that you have decreased filling of the ventricles and therefore decreased output. So there isn't in diastolic heart failure, there isn't necessarily an issue with the heart contracting. The issue is, is with the amount of space in the heart. With systolic heart failure, there's an issue with the heart contracting. There's no issues in terms of how much volume there is available to fill in the ventricles. And the thing to note now is just that we don't usually, we don't say diastolic heart failure anymore. We call it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that will sort of make sense again as to why the volumes don't, uh, the things that's happening is the volume is changing um, available in the heart, not the actual strength of contraction. So that leads us on to talk about other types of biomarkers, which can be sensitive for things like heart failure. So the first thing we'll talk about here is natriuretic peptides. This includes ANP, BNP, and CNP. So ANP, um, these all three have various different locations in the body that they might be found and also various locations in the body where they might be released. Um, all of them, the function is essentially for vasodilation vascularly, and it also inhibits water reabsorption. Um, so what that means is it it's a hypotensive agent. So water reabsorption is what allows more water to be kept in the blood, which increases blood pressure. So if you inhibit water reabsorption, that means you're going to reduce blood pressure and allow, allow more water to be excreted. Importantly, out of these natriuretic peptides, BNP is the one that's important because BNP, an N-terminal breakdown product, which is um, the breakdown product of these natriuretic peptides, are heart failure biomarkers. So when these are elevated, it's an indicator of heart failure. The other one we have here is C-reactive protein, which isn't necessarily um, suggestive to heart failure. It's more an inflammation biomarker. So C-reactive protein is something that's um, synthesized in the liver. It binds to the surface of dying cells and then therefore like increases the inflammation process. And as a result, when you see higher levels of plasma CRP, that predicts a future myocardial infarction. So the other important thing about the natriuretic peptides is that BMP um, can also be used to guide treatment, as in if a person has really low levels of BMP, that might indicate that they're safe to be discharged, whereas if they have high levels of BMP, that might indicate that they should probably be kept on treatment for a little bit longer, as that might predict heart failure, or it might predict that they are currently undergoing heart failure. And that's it from me. All right. Um... So we'll finish off with uh, clean skills um, with the cardiovascular system exam. Uh, here's the overview. So with every, as with everything, we start off with uh, general inspection. Then we proceed um, from peripheral to central. So you inspect hands first, then arms, um, then the face, neck, and finally the chest which you inspect, you palpate, percuss, and then auscultate. Um, you'll need to have a look at the lower limbs too, um, as there are some signs there that can indicate um, CVS issues. So before you start the exam, introduce yourself, confirm the details of the patient, explain what you're gonna do and why you're gonna do it. Um, and since this is a examination that involves looking at the patient's um, well, central body parts, um, you're going to have to explain or discuss the um, exposure that is required for the purpose of this examination. Um, you get the patient to consent. Um, then you uh, give the patient an opportunity to clarify any questions or concerns they have. And um, again, since it might involve some 
um, intimate body parts. Um, you have to provide adequate um, privacy for the patient to get undressed and, um, um, and provide a gown or sheet if um, it's available. Uh, so for the um, cardiovascular system examination, the body needs to be exposed to the waist. However, for female patients or patients who identify as female, um, they can choose to keep their bra on if they like. Um, position, usually you examine from the patient's right side. I think Monash requires you to examine from their right side during the dioskis. Um, and positioning of the patient um, is that they lie on an examination bed at approximately 45 degrees. Um, and don't forget hand hygiene before you start. Um, general inspection, uh, you look at their body habitus and also their build. Um, see, if they're, so see if they're in any pain as well, any distress, um, sweating, shortness of breath, uh, if they look pale, um, or if they have any congenital abnormalities, such as um, Marfan syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. And uh, people with Marfan syndrome are usually like really tall. Um, other congenital abnormalities such as Down syndrome or Turner, or Turner syndrome um, can also lead to CVS um, conditions. Um, so you start off by looking at the hands. Um, peripheral cyanosis is a sign where the um, peripheries are sort of pale, pale to blue. Um, that's because there's a lack of oxygen um, to the uh, supply to the area. Um, there's also clubbing, which you can test by putting two fingers together like this and see if there's a gap in between them. Um, this is called Shamroth sign and it's a positive test if there's no space between them which indicates there is clubbing however clubbing can be quite non-specific um, it can also indicate respiratory or GIT problems um, Osler's notes and Janeway lesions are, are indicative of um, infective endocarditis um, they both occur on the hands they're like little blood spots um, with the differentiation between that Oslo's notes are closer to the fingertips and the painful, whereas Janeway lesions are usually on the palm and not painful. Um, splinter hemorrhages under the nails are also a sign of infective endocarditis. Um, and all, all three of these are due to um, microemboli, so small blood clots that form when the heart is um, when the heart valve is infected in inf uh, infective endocarditis. Um, however, splinter hemorrhages may also just be a sign of trauma to the nail, um, causing a bleed on the nail bed, which um, looks like this as well. Um, uh, furthermore, with the hands, you may be able to see um, tendon xanthomata. So the way I remember it is that xanthomata has a T in it, um, which can stand for tendon. Um, this is contrasted with uh, xanthomasmas, which we'll see later, which are on the eyes. Um, so xanthomata are a sign of um, dyslipidemia. So there's a, um, or usually hyper, hyperlipidemia or cholesterolemia. So there's too much lipids in the patient's body, which depos um, deposits itself on tendons. Um, capillary refill, you test by pressing on a finger for um, a few seconds, then letting go to see how fast um, it returns to the red color under the nail bed. Um, this just tests blood, to, blood flow to the peripheries uh, and is usually under three seconds for a normal adult. It's quicker for children and slower for elderly patients. Um, you should also look for tar staining, which um, can indicate smoking, which is a uh, serious cardiac um, risk factor. Um, now, moving 
moving more centrally to the uh, arms, um, you've got to take vitals, your pulse, your blood pressure, respirate, temp, and even oxat. Um, you should also palpate for the radial um, arteries to test for the radio, radio delay, radio, radio, sorry, um, delay, which um, could mean that there's a um, subclavian artery stenosis or a um, dissection of thoracic aorta, uh, both of which cause the delay due to um, inadequate um, blood supply to one side of one, one arm which you'll, you'll feel as delay in their radial pulses. Um, radio femoral delay is a, a similar principle. Um, I think due to reduced blood flow to the um, radial pulse. Um, and this can indicate a coarctation of the aorta, which is a narrowing of the aorta. Um, you may also find tuberal eruptive xanthomata. So again, on a tendons, um, could a, the tendon on which it occurs may be the elbow, which is why it's under arms as well. Um, now moving to the face, you can examine the eyes for jaundice, which is the yellowing of the eyes. Um, and that, that indicates excessive bilirubin, um, which, um, it could mean that there's um, your blood cells are breaking down and you have an, um, anemia, so low red blood cells, or it could just indicate that you've got um, a GI problem, also digestive system problem. Um, you can examine for um, pallor of the conjunctiva, um, which is pay, um, pale, um, conjunctiva, which is like the, which means there's um, anemia, so low uh, red blood cells, um, which you can see here is sort of like pale and white instead of the usual red that you see in this in this region. Um, Arcus senilis is a ring of white around the um, uh, around the cornea, and it indicates um, cholesterol buildup. Um, Argyle Robertson pupils are small, um, small pupils that constrict poorly to light, but they're still able to move for the accommodation reflex. I think this is pretty low yield, so you don't need to know too much about this. Um, Xanthalasma uh, is deposition of cholesterol again on the eyes. So um, that could indicate hypercholesterolemia. Um, cheeks, mitral facies. Um, so you get sort of flushing around the cheeks um, specifically and nowhere else. Um, so in mitral stenosis, where the mitral valve um, narrows and can't open properly, um, and also in pulmonary hypertension. So you'll get abnormal flushing cheeks. Um, and for the mouth, you can check for central cy cyanosis, um, which is pretty serious usually. Uh, that means you've got a reduced blood flow to the um, head and neck region. Um, you can also check for a high arch palate, which indicates Marfan syndrome. Um, and look at, you can look at teeth and gums for signs of bleeding. Um, so in the neck, you can palpate the carotid pulse. Um, be careful not to palpate both sides at once. Uh, that way you'll make the patient faint because there won't be enough blood flow to the brain. Um, and do not press at the level that's um, higher than thyroid cartilage. So your Adam's apple don't go above there because pressing on the carotid sinus, um, as you'll come to learn in physiology, um, your body will just to like ex, um, to increase pressure by reducing cardiac output essentially, and you'll you'll get the patient to faint as well. Um, and auscultation, um, you listen with your stethoscope for um, bruits, 
So uh, there will be turbulent blood flow if there's atherosclerosis of the um, carotid artery, um, so causing carotid stenosis, artery stenosis, um, which you'll hear on the stethoscope. Uh, the JVP, jugular venous pressure, um, is something you measure, uh, and it's more or less indicative of right atrial pressure. Um, you get the patient to lie down at 45 degrees, tilt their head left, and um, measure, or shine the torch on um, the neck, and you should see a small pulse um, that's just barely visible there. Um, and as you can see on this image, um, in between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, you should be able to see a little jugular vein pulse. Um, and you measure, um, you measure the vertical distance from the sternal angle. So, um, from the sternal angle to the jugular vein, um, top of the jugular venous pulse. Um, and this distance should um, not exceed three centimeters usually in normal adults. Um, and the abdominal jugular reflex you test by pressing on the center of the abdomen for 10 seconds. The JVP should um, rise transiently in a normal patient. So, or in a normal person, it should rise and readjust and fall back down. But um, with someone with um, say right heart failure, theirs would stay up, stay elevated. Um, now the precordium is just the part of the chest that um, you examine in a cardiovascular examination. So you first inspect for, so look for thoracic cage abnormalities, any scars, any rashes, discoloration, any attachments such as pacemaker or defib boxes. And um, check if you can see the apex beat, which normally should be invisible. So the apex beat is where the um, apex of the heart is. Um, that's the left ventricle, and normally you shouldn't see it. Um, you shouldn't see it beating. Um, palpation, you should palpate for the apex beat. See if it's in the normal position of um, approximately mid clavicular line, fifth intercostal, <clears throat> and also feel for any heaves or thrills um, <clears throat> at each of these locations. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> as we talked a bit about earlier, you don't actually um, listen to or palpate uh, the uh, for the valves at where the valves are. You you listen to where or palpate where the blood passing through them will go to. So for the mitral valve, you sort of palpate in the fifth intercostal mid clavicular line. So tricuspid, um, you palpate and auscultate the um, fourth or fifth intercostal um, or left parasternal um, border. Uh, and for pulmonary is uh, you listen to or palpate the second intercostal um, left parasternal. And for the aortic, um, valve, you palpate and listen to the second intercostal space, um, <clears throat> right parasternal. Um, auscultation or percussion, I skip percussion because that's um, something that's not really used anymore for, the, um, for a cardiovascular exam. Um, you can't get much out of it. Um, auscultation, so you use the bell, so the small, small part of the um, stethoscope head for lower sounds and you use a diaphragm for higher pitch sounds you should use both at each area um, so what you're listening for is the um, two heart two main heart sounds the lub and the dub um, the lub is essentially um, systole and the dub is um, diastole um, and um, you've 
you can use some maneuvers to make the sound more, um, make the sound louder. So when you're uh, listening to the mitral, mitral area, um, you can get the patient to lie on the left side, exhale and hold their breath. Uh, for tricuspid, um, get them sitting up to inhale and hold the breath. And um, same for pulmonary. Uh, and for aort aortic valve, um, you get them to sit up, exhale and hold their breath. Um, right, so you've got S1, the first sound, lub for systole, when the ventricles um, contract and um, you've got S2, which is dub, that's when diastole happens and the um, atria contract and ventricles expand. Um, listen for any additional sounds. Um, so click snaps, that's not usually there. Um, usually you should just hear love and dub. Uh, abnormal sounds, S3 and S4. Um, S3 is right after S2 and S4 would occur right before S1 in the cycle. Um, they're both abnormal. So you should only hear two two heart sounds, um, love and dub. Um, murmurs, um, systolic or diastolic murmurs, um, they can be classified as. Uh, systolic murmurs may be normal or abnormal, but diastolic murmurs are always abnormal. So diastolic murmurs are during S2, um, systolic murmurs during S1. So looking at the lower limbs and the back, um, for the back, uh, you can see sometimes see sacral edema in patients with um, heart failure um, or prolonged bed rest, which is um, because the fluid builds up in the patient's back, lower back. Um, and this is also going to cause a um, pitting edema because it's fluid based. So you can press it and it will leave a dent. Um, for the lower limbs, you've got... Um, Pedal edema, which is ankle swelling. Um, since it's fluid, um, it pit, it's pitting as well. Uh, you may see tendon xanthomata on the Achilles tendon um, in the lower limbs. Uh, the toes may club as well, like these. You've got clubbing toes. Um, peripheral vascular disease would re it's sort of like atherosclerosis, but for lower limbs. And you would see peripheral cyanosis due to decreased blood flow, reduced capillary refill to the toes, um, which you can test on the toes. Um, and you can also palpate for um, femoral, popliteal, um, posterior tibial, and dorsalis pedis um, pulses to assess for blood flow via each of these arteries. Um, you may also see pallor. Um, or further down the track of um, illness, you may see uh, cyanosis. Um, you can see hair loss, cool skin, ulcers, which means it's easily infected. These all are um, indicative of um, reduced blood flow, which can be due to peripheral vascular disease. Um, and that concludes the presentation for clinical skills.